Hey, Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent joins me. Hello. Hi, Joe. Just seen a few bits. Erling Haaland has beaten Lewandowski to the Bundesliga Player of the Year. I just saw that in the last while, flicking through news sites there. Harry, Harry Maguire likely to miss the Europa League final tomorrow. Um, and a few other bits going on. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has been talking, Dan. I do want to talk to you about the Irish squad name by uh, Stephen Kenny in a moment. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has just been talking over in Gdansk in the last hour or two where the final is on. I thought I knew most things about the 1999 treble win. So he was asked for some memories about the final. And it turns out Ole, not a fan of Concord. The difference is we flew Concord to Barcelona. That was a horrible, horrible flight. So the flight yesterday was comfortable. I was just going to ask you uh, quickly, what was so bad about Concorde? And is there anything else that you've um, learned from 99 that you've kind of borrowed for the game tomorrow? That Concorde flight was horrible. I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes I get seasick as well when they, you know them, when it just, it just rolls you from side to side. I was sick and I had to go to the toilet. It was horrible. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, they got grounded not long after uh, as well. <laughs> so uh, what I learned, trust your team, trust your uh, gut instinct. Uh, obviously, I'll tell the, uh, the, the team or especially the subs that are not starting that they might have to play a big part for us because uh, it's happened before. And um, be disappointed, be angry with me, but be ready when you come on. And whoever starts, make sure you enjoy it because uh, it is. Uh, you don't play too many finals in your life. There you go. And when he was walking out, he was still going on about Concord to one of the journalists. So really did not enjoy it, Dan. No, I wasn't aware of that aspect of the, uh, the build-up. I mean, yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, I mean, Concord. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. we're cl clutching at straws if that's all that's left, really, to pick a, 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 off the bone of the uh, '99 experience. But hey, it's new info. <laughs> yeah, we've got to find out that the breakfast in the hotel actually was well below standard as well too. But um, yeah, I mean, this it's sort of crept up and uh, it's crept up in me this final tomorrow. I have yeah. to admit, in some ways, you know, um, uh, this is such a Champions League sort of vibe and the Premier League stuff. But I mean, it is. I, I suppose in recent years, in a way, like you're so used to a team you're using the Europa League for a route into the Champions League in some ways but they don't have that problem it's actually just about winning a trophy which would be nice yeah. you know a big game in isolation Are you an aviation person? Would you know all about Concord if I asked you? Um, I mean an, an aviation person in, in the sense that I, I like going on planes when we used to do that but yeah. not really great on my history other than maybe seeing some of the reading in the air stuff about uh, or whatever it was about the, the glorious era of Concord in the 70s, wasn't it? When it was like, well, I was this just, is where you wanted to be seen. Yeah, well, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot here. Like, I've checked here. I wouldn't just have thrown that to you without giving you a prior warning because I wouldn't be at all. So this was all kind of news to me. I do remember them flying by Concord and I remember uh, Ferguson in the cockpit and waving out the window and all that kind of stuff when they were taken off. So Concord, Dan, they first entered service. In, you're dead right in the 1970s. There were only 20 of them built and obviously they were all about speed and uh, luxury pretty expensive so in 1997 if you were to get a return trip from London to New York that was $8,000 so that was uh, expensive mm. to say the least I hadn't really I mean I, again I wouldn't be on top of this stuff at all so when Solskjaer says there that they were grounded not long after 99 he's not wrong so there were 20 of them built they were grounded in 2003 a year after United flew there was a uh, crash, desperate, horrific on a Parisian runway in which all passengers and crew were killed. I think 109 people were uh, killed and they say September 11th didn't help the obvious, the market generally anyway, but it seems they were grounded then in 03, so 1976 to 2003 including Manchester United in 99. That's the uh, brief story of Concord for you, Dan. Yeah, I mean, there's get that Netflix series going straight away, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'll try and do better. One episode. I'll try and do better. One episode. This isn't yeah. the most exciting um, stuff I've ever brought to you. But there you go. <laughs> That's Salskar in uh, Gdansk, and we'll talk to Andy West, no, Andy West uh, later on. So we didn't, uh, given the Premier League finale, we didn't touch on Stephen Kenny's naming of the Irish squad at all. Uh, these games, of course, coming on June. Third against Andorra. Now in Andorra, COVID restrictions changing all the time. So June 3rd in Andorra and then Budapest, Hungary, June 8th and all around a nine-day camp in Spain. I'll come to the squad in a second. I know Stephen Kenny's putting a fair degree of importance on this camp in terms of implementing a style and building up a sense of momentum. 
Yeah, well, I suppose you know the thing about this camp is that it's actually the first chance he's had to do something like that in real terms. I mean, when you think that Stephen Kenny's Ireland camp so far, um, you know, in September they played what Bulgaria, I think, on a Thursday. In October, Slovakia was was similar. Um, then the England game was early in an international window, and then the last time round it was Serbia, which is a, a Wednesday game, I think. And, you know, so you've had a situation where the players arrive in and within 48 hours, you know, or 72 hours, you know, of, of actual maybe two full training sessions, maybe three training sessions, um, you're, you're actually putting out a team for a competitive game that really matters. And then, listen, um, I mean, this, this, this will obviously sound like excuses, but obviously, you know, they, they then had, in particular in October and November, um, they had those big COVID issues, which included, you know, players been taken out of the equation on on the morning of games so i definitely think in in the sort of in the in the when you're sort of weighing up and in, in sort of mitigation i think certainly preparation for games has been a difficulty albeit you know a lot of other countries have faced exactly the same um limited window to prepare for games but i suppose when you're when you're a new manager whose appointment is very closely associated or the the the, the discussion around it is centered around say trying to introduce a certain style of play or, or to change the style of play, then um, the idea to have a, a sort of a, a training camp where you basically have sort of certainly, you know, six days, five, six days before a game with Andorra, which really, you know, like is, is a game Ireland you would think would win, um, you know, and, and they will then get back to training, you would assume, and really play Hungary on June the 8th after you know, 10, you know, 9, 10, 11 days properly working together. I think certainly if, you know, at the end of that, with the group of players that shows up, you would be hoping to see probably a more secure identity in what the team is, is trying to do. Like at times we have seen that. I think there has been some good errors here and there, you know, and and um, it's been putting together that 90-minute winning, you know, consistent sort of winning performance that, that has been the issue. And I think certainly... Uh, the chance to have a bit of time away with the group, albeit missing quite a few bodies, I think it can only be viewed as a as a positive opportunity. Mm. I think. Couple of new faces in there. Yeah, so there's four new, new. Well, there's four uncapped members in the squad, and then there's you know a couple who've barely been rounded before, such as Leo Connor and, and one or two others. Uh, but yeah, the, the I suppose the headline news would have been uh, that the four uncapped players who would be uh, Jamie McGrath from St Marin. Danny Mandrew from Shamrock Rovers, Andrew Omoba Medele uh, from Norwich, young centre half, and then um, the fourth one is Chidozi Ogbene, who's uh, playing for Rotherham. He's a winger. Mm. Um, the interesting thing about them is that you know Kenny would have previous experience with with three of them, um, in the sense that you know Ogbene would have been started off in the League of Ireland here with Cork City, and Limerick would have played against Kenny. I think he was quite keen even to try and bring out Benny to Dundalk at one point. Uh, he's a sort of a fast right winger. Um, Kenny's point, the point he would have made yesterday is that um, a lot of the wide players he has in his squad like to cut inside, like as is the, the trend with a lot of right players who play a right footer on the left or whatever. Um, whereas, you know, Benny is very much, uh, in, or as he sees him, you know, an out and out right sided player. Uh, Amoba Bedele has been excellent for Norwich, a young centre half in terms of their promotion charge. Uh, and I suppose. You know, his inclusion just speaks for itself. You know, he's been playing for a team that's got promoted regularly at the training camp, the chance to work with him. He's a League Slip United graduate. Um, and then the other two is the most, to me, is, you know, I would have been writing about this today. I think probably the most significant calls in a way are McGrath and Mandrew because listen, he would have known what, you know, you know, sort of they've been available to him throughout. In particular, McGrath has been available to him throughout. But clearly, uh, you know, Mandrew has, has improved a lot since joining Shamrock Rovers into the window uh, over the winter sorry, from, from Bohemians. But he would have been with the 21s with, with Kenny. McGrath is a player that Kenny brought to Dundalk four years ago. But what's striking is basically the acknowledgement that he's gone to bring in what he feels are two natural number 10s into his team in McGrath and Mandrew. Um, that, OK, you know, they are playing at sort of lower levels, so you know, certainly in the case of Mandrew and, and you know McGrath St. Marin seventeen goals this season, which is incredible. But they did finish up in the in the bottom half of the, the Scottish table. So in the latter half of the season he wouldn't have been playing maybe a great standard of game relative to say championship footballer, the handful of Premier League players there is. 
but um, it's their individual attributes that have got them into the squad and that Kenny clearly after you know 11 games has probably been in situations and games where they've lacked maybe you know, or in his view they've lacked that real natural number 10 who is you know at home playing off a striker you know picking a pass and he did make the point that Jack Byrne has been around and is probably the closest thing to a number 10 and certainly Jack Byrne I think would be described as a considered natural number 10 but he did talk about how Byrne likes the, his style is to get back into midfield a lot more and pick passes whereas McGrath is very attacking you know and Mandrew seems to be happiest in that area and he's gone for players who it's their it's their style and their attributes maybe as opposed to say where they play um, that has got them into this group and you know some would say that's what you would expect Stephen Kenny to do but obviously when you get into the squad it can be difficult sometimes to, to leave out players who are playing at a, at a higher level than some other options Yeah that point jumped out to me as well about the natural number 10 so on Mandrew and Jamie McGrath and geez, 17 goals from midfield for St Mirren that gets everyone sitting up a bit straighter mm. I think 24 years of age he said on McGrath that he's been a gradual improver Technically excellent, very good feet, good right and left foot, works very hard, creative player, different type of player to the midfield players that we have. So that's very promising. But on the two of them and on that theme about a number 10, in your piece today, even in the Irish Independent, he said, we probably haven't had a traditional number 10 in the squad. We had Jack Byrne. Jack likes to come back into midfield and make passes. That's the point you were making. And then he went on to say the other midfield players like Alan Brown, Jeff Hendrick, Jason Malumby or Jason Knight, they're traditional attacking midfielders. They're not natural number 10s as such, but Jamie and Dan are both very much so. Yeah, and I think obviously, I mean, he has at times and probably in the future will play some of those players, I think, in the number 10 position in games. But like someone like Alan Brown, for example, who I think has actually been pretty effective when he's, when he's played, um, you know, in terms of getting into goal scoring positions. I mean, he scored the goal in, in, uh, in Serbia and, and nearly scored in Slovakia. But he's like you people talk to, talk to people about Alan Brown as a number ten, and he's more about the pressing, you know, from the from the front almost, you know. And he's sort of like the point is, and I think we've discussed this in the show before that there's a, probably a perception of a number ten that they don't cover a huge amount of ground, that they sort of you know glide around the place a bit, you know, and they pick their passes when they want. When actually, in a lot of teams now, particularly ones who are maybe under the cosh at times in games, the number 10 actually can be the hardest worker or certainly cover the most distance. Mm. And someone like Alan Brown would have that function. Um, but someone like McGrath in particular, I mean, he's someone who... It's, it's funny, like, Jamie McGrath, many years back, I remember being at the game. Um, you might even have been at this game. It was St. Pat's playing in Dundalk one night, and he was a young sub with St. Pat's who um, come off the bench for maybe 10 minutes mm. and did a couple of little pirouettes and skills. And everyone was like, oh, this, this guy's good. Mm. But it was very much under the radar. And he, he was brought to the dock, I think, you know, uh, by Kenny. And I think the feeling at the time was, I mean, he barely lifted a weight in his life. You know, he was very uh, physically had a lot to do. But technically, he had everything, really, or certainly a lot of his attributes. And he's just steadily improved and improved and improved and yes 17 goals this season there was quite a lot of penalties in that but even still he is someone who can just do things he sort of glides in terms of his style and if you have a situation where you think there are games and, and maybe you look back now um even to games like Luxembourg which I don't think Kenny will ever forget you know and is sort of still probably haunted by it until he does something very good um that the, you know th there probably have been times in games you know where where that's the type of player that Ireland have needed on the pitch um and they haven't you know they're, they're you're obviously going with the established uh you know midfielders who maybe aren't the most natural options in terms of maybe being creative in that real against the team that's defending a bit more against you you know and yeah. that's that's a situation that Ireland in the autumn, like Kenny needs some wins. Like, I mean, that's, I mean, it's a pretty obvious comment. And yes, the games against Portugal and Serbia are going to be probably games where people like Alan Brown, as I discussed, and, and Jeff Hendrick, when he's used in the number 10 role, the, you know, there's going to be a lot of work rate because you're going to be at times out of possession for a long period of time. But some of the other matches, you know, the Azerbaijan and Luxembourg, where he needs to win, you probably need to be stacked with more creative players on the ball as opposed to maybe players who are trying to get on the break and anticipate things, but maybe that players that can offer you that something different uh, that McGrath and, and, and Mandrew 
um, can offer. Yeah. One last point on this Irish squad. God, and God, it wouldn't have been nice if we were talking about the Euros as opposed to friendlies against Andorra. Oh, and yeah. Man. Yeah. So yeah, he was just awesome. talking about the fact that he has promoted 15 players from underage teams already in his tenure, capping 13 of them, which is quite a lot, especially in the midst of desperately needing a win, I suppose. Uh, he was making the point, Dan, I think it's a reflection of what's happened maybe in the previous decade. He's talked about this gap. And maybe we've touched on it ourselves at times, but it's it's interesting that it was very much to the front of his mind. This void of players maybe in their early to mid-20s because previous managers weren't blooding them or weren't giving them chances or maybe, to be fair, just didn't think they were good enough. So almost this sense now that we're playing uh, catch-up. So he said, uh, some feel it's too much change too quickly and I understand that viewpoint, but in my opinion, it's necessary because we've had absolutely no development for about eight or nine years. We've had absolutely no development for about eight or nine years. We've had one player through in nine years and nobody looking at that. And then a huge demographic of players who are 29 and 30 and 20 and very little in between. We have to have a bigger vision for what we want to achieve going forward by integrating these players. Yeah, no, I mean, it is a point that has been made like I think by a number of people in, in recent times and I think, yeah, it's, it's players between the age of sort of 22 and, and 28, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a large number of players in the squad of the 1992 generation, you know, Brady and Hendrick and Matt Doherty. But then if you go down the ages, um, you know, not, not so much in terms of the next sort of five, six, seven years, right up to the players born in 99 and 2000. And there's a lot of talented players around that. And I listen, I mean, they're, we were still exporting the same number of players, um, you know, most of those years. But obviously, just they haven't come through to the same level, and and, and they maybe weren't as prepared. And I think the point was was made at one one stage was that, you know, I think Jack Byrne and Graham Burke, who at the time were both playing for Shamrock Rovers, were the only players from Dublin to have been capped in that age bracket. Now, when you think at the moment in in Ireland, like there's obviously a an ongoing turf war that continues, and a you know dispute between say the schoolboy game and. You know, the, a lot of it is centred around Dublin, Dublin District School Boys League, um, who in recent years have produced some outstanding players, by the way, um, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the switch towards the League of Ireland at that level. But clearly, you know, what, what solutions we found have been imperfect, but sometimes it w- you would almost be uh, given the opinion that what we had before was a flawless system that was working on a consistent basis, churning out high-quality players all the time. That's not true either, yeah. you know. Um, and and we've we've you know there's been there have been fallow years and and years where things haven't worked out for players for whatever reason, um. But there are like a there's a glut of reasonably talented or, or very talented young players at the moment. But it's it is interesting how you know it's not always the the, the ones that you 100% expect. You know like we're not we're I'm not writing off at all by any stretch the likes of Troy Parrott. He's got loads of time on his side and there's almost too much pressure, but. You could have like one of your power rankings thing about the, the the pecking order of the young players you're talking about, and it it can swing wildly in the space of twelve months. And someone like you know a moment with LA, he would have been spoken about a bit last year because he, you know, but he wasn't necessarily in an outstanding Irish under seventeen team, unlike some of the others. And now out of nowhere, he's going to the Premier League, having played a load of games. Yeah. Um, it can change that quickly. Yeah. England, by the way. We thought they would be naming their squad today, but then it emerged last night that wouldn't be happening. So they have to get it down to 26. Slightly expanded squads this year, you can name 26. But Gareth Southgate today named 33 players in fairness. They have Manchester United playing tomorrow. They have Chelsea and Man City playing at the weekend. He wants to see who comes through on the injury front. The big news was that Trent Alexander-Arnold was included in the 33, but obviously Kyle Walker is going to go. Kieran Trippier, and we'll ask Andy about this as well. Actually, has just won a league title with Atletico and seems to be highly regarded. Rhys James is obviously there, thereabouts. Alexander Arnold left out of the squad in March. I mean, I get that he's not great defensively thing, and the Real Madrid away match I'm sure looms large in Southgate's mind. But he's just so outrageously talented. You know what? Thirty two assists in three years. It's kind of hard to imagine him not being in the twenty six. So. He's, well, he's waiting like everybody else to find out. What's your read on that one? Yeah, I, like I've always thought that he'll eventually end up in the squad. But, but you know, and I know in fairness, though, like the, that 26 was a change from the traditional 23. And listen, the messages 
you know, from not covering the English team and like the messages from those who were, I mean, it did seem quite genuine that he was in bother. I mean, there was quotes and and information to that effect. But as you mentioned, to me, like, you know, major tournaments, um, and we'll see how things pan out for England, but they are now, you know, we've had years sort of probably, you know, depending on your perspective and whether you're sort of Nathan Murphy's child or not, like laughing or enjoying you know, or, you know, taking various joys or their levels of despair from England's major tournament struggles, whereas now, like, they are proper players and contenders. And you will think at some stage in the tournament, England are going to be in a knockout game where they need a goal. Yeah. And they're going to be probably maybe dominating the ball for a period of time. And, you know, the the opportunity to bring on, like, a right-back, you know, or a right-sided player in that situation who can do what he does on the ball... Mm you got to think that's going to be pretty tempting like in a in a knockout situation to have that to have that option at least on your bench yeah. the 26 man squad i'd have thought so i'd have thought so i just can't believe it's 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 a distinct possibility he'll be left out but look Southgate I'm sure has taken a fuller view of things even just glancing at the 33 man squad I mean some of the talent they have now it's amazing oh, it's they, yeah. they really have in fairness to them in the last 20 years turned this thing around and their production line around I mean Mason Mount Phil Foden Jack Grealish Mason Greenwood was named Harry Kane obviously Marcus Rashford Jaden Sancho Raheem Sterling I mean on it goes Jesse Lingard got named in the squad as well on the back of his form but like I mean maybe Southgate's like I'm not that worried about creativity and goals looking at that but it's just outrageous It is no like and they, they, they have as you mentioned they've got it right and I mean they've also listen they've you know they, 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 they've got a lot of things right including in terms of even the eligibility wars and stuff of like that like how they've organized themselves at that level because mm. there are a number of players there as as we know very well you know that they could have ended up playing for other countries and um they you know England at times at underage level you know they they were happy to let other players play their underage football with other countries you know because they they they, they held the cards eventually to to to, to get them back and um in the past they would have been more asleep at the wheel i think in mm. terms of players slip and that I mean like they, 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 listen it's a great talent production and, and it's representative of their system but obviously there are players like Declan Rice that just surprise people as well too yeah. you know released by Chelsea at some stage and all of a sudden they soar and mm. um, you know but not like it is and they are stacked with all sorts of different types of players so you know when you think in our um, again you, you go back to our time probably watching England in tournaments where it's sort of the three or four attacking options it's like you know, the, there was periods of time where it's well, is Crouch going to be a game changer for them, or you know, Darius Fassell under Sven, and you know, different types of players that you know were very good players at you know Premier League level, but like their their option B at times off the bench maybe would have been a bit, uh, you know, rudimentary in a way. But like now, it's 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 they, they've got all sorts of different types of players. I mean, like Grealish is amazing in my view. I think he's an absolutely terrific player. Yeah. And yeah, it took him so long to even get in there which says a lot about what they have. No, it does, absolutely. Uh, a few texts in, I, like Dan, am not much of an aviation expert, but I know Concorde's cruising altitude was higher than normal, so it should have encountered less turbulence, thereby giving you less chance of spilling your complimentary champagne. Ole was unlucky to have had a rough flight, says Pat, with some impressive knowledge there. Uh, Ma- Ortiz Mike Murphy set a world record for the longest putt ever when travelling on Concord. Fact, says Roger in Sandy Mount. I mean, there's a lot of great records to have. That is definitely one of them. Uh, this episode, says uh, JP in brackets, of the likes of Mike, it was broadcast on 8th of March, 1977. He was putting wow. a golf ball on board Concord while travelling at twice the speed of sound. There you go. Um, what was that on the stint meter at the green? Like, you know, that's, that'd be the question. Well... You know? I have the answer. Mike Murphy calculates that given the speed the plane was travelling at, that the ball travelled the equivalent of two miles in the four seconds it took to take the putt. Obviously, that's not quite the stint meter, <laughs> but it's a good stat all the same. I suppose the line would be, you know, well, he held it, but he dodged, you know, hitting the one back, obviously, <laughs> you know. That would have been a bit of a ch- challenge. And Paul, Paul, you read my mind, to be honest. Does all this talk of Gdansk, the Europa League final tomorrow, not bring back memories of Euro 2012? Yes. I mean, that's why, like, if, if you were there, that's what all Gdansk uh, means. That was my I first guess. thought when I heard Gdansk earlier. Yeah. I was like, oh, that stadium. You know, I, I kind of visualised in the, the stadium. Yeah. And um, Paul you know, Gdansk, says, Sopot, and Gdynia and all of that. Sopot. All that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember being at that Spain game, says Paul, stadium miles out, walking through a small forest to get there, the long wait for the train to bring us back into town. Yeah. I remember that too. God, nine years. 
Nine nice years, place, Dan. Nice place to dance. I think their, their tourist board brought us over for a jolly a couple of months before. You know, it was very much like, you know, come and see our wonderful city in all its glory. And obviously when the Euros come round, nobody saw that city because yeah. it was covered in, in green, you know, and vomit and drink. And <laughs> Just a few things before we begin to wrap up domestically. Sligo Rovers top of the table. I mean, I, I I look away for a second thinking, well, Shamrock Rovers have this whole thing uh, wrapped up in many ways and then Rovers beat them last night at Tallis Stadium by a goal to nil. So that's a big improvement on last year. What also caught the eye, obviously, was Dundalk losing 5-1 to Bowes. They were 4-0 down after an hour. They're 11 points off third spot now. Jim Jilton afterwards, Dan, obviously their sporting director and interim manager as well. They're starting to feel a bit like Niall Quinn when he was managing Sunderland and things weren't going that well, to be honest. Uh, but what caught the eye was where he said, we need a clear out. This place mm. needs a clear out. Uh, we we'll need to recruit players who can handle the pressure of playing here. There is a certain degree of pressure. You need players who can do that. And I think at the minute we don't have them. And on he went. I mean, when you're talking like we need a clear out, oof, not good. Not it's good dramatic. at all. Yeah. yeah and, and it's really like I was up in Dundalk on Friday where there was a protest before the game against the ownership. Then they beat Shamrock Rovers, ending the longest unbeaten run in League of Ireland history. But Shamrock Rovers then followed up by losing to Sligo Rovers on the Monday. But on Friday night, like there's a sense that Magilton is there going, OK, maybe we've turned some kind of corner here. Mm. Now, that was a sort of the language that was being used around the place afterwards. And then three days later, you know, as you mentioned, they're, they're four down and a rabble, basically. Um, I'm not so sure how those comments about a clear out will necessarily um, go down. I am. Possibly I'm, 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 I'm pretty oh, sure. Oh, no, sorry. Go down. <laughs> badly, badly. Yeah, really so badly. Clear. Really badly. Yeah. That, like, can you imagine the atmosphere in there now? Yeah, and I think, I think you know, Jim Jilton hasn't arrived in... Like, listen, I think Jim Jilton, by the way, tactically was very good against Shamrock Rovers on Friday, but then sent out the same team three days later, which is possibly a questionable um, call because they've been a pretty demanding game. But I think when he's been interim manager for... If he's in for a, a weekend, you know, you can maybe say that, but he's been there for quite a while. So I think I've seen some local commentary from ex-players today saying that I don't know if the if a manager can distance themselves too much from a, a five one defeat. I think you have to own some of the um own some of the criticism. But clearly, um, you know, there's there's been a lot going on there behind the scenes and uh, in his day job as such, when things go back to normal, whatever normal is in the yeah. block these days, he will have a say in contracts and and then um, and these things will be remembered. But it's just something going on every week up there at the moment. It's, it does, not, it's not getting any, it any does, better. Yeah, it does feel that way. When I draw the parallel with Niall Quinn, it's more the um, interim manager part as opposed to, I think Quinn was O oh, five and O oh when he, uh, when yeah, Roy eventually yeah. picked up the phone. So I know it's not quite that bad when they beat Shamrock Rose on Friday, to be fair. What about the Jim McGuinness talk and all that? How has that gone down? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you had that sort of surreal thing at full time on Friday when they beat Shamrock Rovers and then the PA man played Jimmy's winning matches over the PA system at full time. It's right. like it's like you're living through an episode of Phoenix Nights or something. Right. Sometimes. I don't really know what's what's going on. That was just a joke, by the way. There's no like meaning to be uh, attached to it. It, I mean, it does appear like whatever was discussed with McGuinness was was more short term in nature or certainly yes. he wasn't he wasn't being offered the the job and was know, the word that McGuinness wasn't too keen on a short term option yeah that was the suggestion alright but I mean I, I am also wary that there's around on dark stuff there's an element of spin and counter spin with a lot of okay. um, versions of stories and events and a lot of figures are still circling around the place and it's it's actually quite hard to get a read on the place in some ways it used to be a Stephen Kenny club and he ran the show and everything was underneath it mm. whereas now there's all sorts of different actors and players and influential agents and um, yeah, it's it's a strange it's a strange cocktail. It doesn't sound great. Okay, Dan, we will say goodbye. My thanks to you, Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent. Cheers for all that. Cheers, Joe. See you again, Dan, uh, with us uh, most Tuesday evenings and obviously on the Saturday show as well. Always wor well worth catching that chat on uh, Saturday afternoons with the likes of Dan and Johnny Ward and David Myler and others with John Duggan every uh, Saturday afternoon across the season. And uh, now, competition time. News Talks 10K Payday. All this week on News Talk, it's 10k payday on Friday. We're giving you the chance to win €10,000. All you have to do is answer one question. The money could be in your account this Friday to be in with the chance 
of winning. Just answer this simple question. Which of the following EU countries does not use the euro? Germany or Denmark? Text the word win. Your name and answer and address to 57599. Text cost €2.50. Euro and you have to be over 18 years of age. Lines close this Friday at 5 o'clock. The winner will be announced on the hard shoulder on Friday evening. It's News Talk's 10k payday. You can find out more at newstalk.com. Best of luck with that. Football on off the